Hey guys, this is Comic Uno and Comic Frontline, and today I'm doing Comic Uno episode 77. And this show will review all the comics I read this week in one show. Um, so let's get started. We go worst pick of the week, the best pick of the week. Uh, I have 22 comics, so a good amount of comics this week. So like I said, let's get started. Worst pick of the week is World's End or two issue 11. Uh, with World's End. This is actually uh, two weeks in a row this has been the worst pick of the week. Uh, is it horrible? No. At least it doesn't jump as much as it did with uh, the last issue or two, which got, you know, a lower grade. Uh, this is just one story, just one boring story, though. It's about the son of Darkseid, Fury, Barda, in who's on whose team, and you find out that Fury is on the son of uh, Mr. Miracle's uh, side, and Darkseid's, oh, well, I'm still gonna rule the world anyways and try to destroy it. Uh, so overall, I just was not interested in the story. I don't really care about these characters. Uh, artwork's pretty good, though. At least it's one cohesive story, but just none of the story actually made me interested. But for people that do like these characters, you might like the story a bit more. So World's End issue 11 uh, is number 22. Worst pick of the week. I gave it 2.5 stars. All right, so let's move on to number 21, which is... Future's End, issue 33, another weekly here. Uh, Future's End did get a little bit of a boost because some of the stories interest me. Uh, the the Frankenstein story really didn't interest me. That was so boring. That was even more boring than World's End, but it's only a bit of a story. Uh, other stories, you know, um, 50 Sue is a little crazy. Still don't like her character that much, but... She's there, at least her story is a bit more cohesive. Uh, then we get to see Batman Beyond. His is okay, you know, at least they're doing something with him for the fans, uh, for people that are fans of this character, which as you guys know, I'm not. But I do like the Firestorm story a lot. I can't wait to see where that goes. I think it's a really cool mix of Madison and um, Jason Binks' uh, Firestorm and then seeing uh, the Doctor become Doctor Pol uh, Polaris. So I thought that was pretty cool. And artwork is, you know, good in certain places. Uh, Good example is uh, 50 Sue's okay artwork, but um, some of the details are a little off, but overall it's okay artwork. Um, and, you know, average artwork, I would say. Uh, so overall, you know, I like certain stories like the Firestorm story, but still a lot of stories I don't care about, like Batman Beyond and <laughs> that Frankenstein story, which I really don't care about. Uh, 50, uh, 50 Sue's okay, you know. I have somewhat care about it, but really don't. So overall, I will say I just didn't care for this story that much. So Future's End issue 33 gets 2.5 stars. All right, number 20 is Scarlet Spiders issue 2. Uh, I know a lot of people are enjoying Scarlet Spiders, but this is just a story I don't really know where it's going. I don't think this is going to affect the Spider-Verse main story at all. And I think with this issue, it was kind of worse than the first issue, because at least the first issue had the, our characters interacting, which I actually like the chemistry between all the clones. But um, with this issue, you see them less interacting, and it's more about, oh, well, we gotta go here. Oh, well, you gotta do this. So it's more of like running around type thing. Um, also, a big complaint of uh, this issue is, and I would say the series in general, is the muscles that they try to show in the artwork. I hate that they're showing literally every detail of the muscles, and it just doesn't work for the issue, at least in my opinion. Uh, even, like, Human Torch looked a bit weird. Uh, like, I understand it's like a different artistic point of view of the Human Torch, but uh, it just wasn't my style. So overall, Scarlet Spiders, I feel like, could be a skippable, skippable series, but it's one more issue, th so that's why I'm sticking with it. Uh, but oh, yeah, overall, it's just people running around in this issue, and artwork could definitely be better. So Scarlet Spiders issue 2, for me, gets 2.5 stars, and that's number 20 on the list. Alright, let's move on to number... 19, which is Batman Eternal, issue 37. So Batman Eternal here um, is a bit lower, not because of the story, because I thought the story was very cohesive, and actually the story was okay. Um, it's mostly about Catwoman becoming a villain, but still saying, hey Batman, 
we can still be friends. <laughs> so that's my Catwoman voice. But no, but she seriously says, hey, you know what? I'm a villain, but Batman doesn't mean that we, we can't, you know, still be lovers. But uh, so I guess Batman has to make a decision about that. And the villains try to team up with each other to figure out what's going on with Gotham now. You know, Gotham's falling to pieces. What are the villains doing? So overall, the story was okay. Like, I you know, did it blow my mind? No. Like, you know, I think the past stories have been better, but the artwork was very, very uh, sketchy. Um, it just did not work for me. Uh, very bright in place. And I always co uh, complain about dark artwork, but I just thought the artwork here was just too bright. Not a lot of detail on the villains. Uh, also, there's just a page that looks smudged. It didn't even look produced well. Over here, it looked copied. Uh, it, the quality of, of the pictures just did not look good in, the, in these two Catwoman and uh, Batman pages here. Uh, if you look closely, it just looked copied. I don't know, maybe it's just my edition, but... Uh, yeah, overall, Batman Eternal story-wise was okay, but then the art really brought this issue down. So, Batman Eternal issue 37 gets 2.5 stars from me, and is number 19 on the list. So, now we're up to number... We're up to number 18, and that's my only digital comic, my only indie comic for this week, which is Cinderella Issue 2. Uh, so Cinderella is a Zenoscope book. Um, it's definitely going more towards people that have read Zenoscope longer than I have. And Cinderella is going into the whole hell story, which I really don't know much about. And uh, I think that's why this issue is a bit lower. As much as I like the artwork, I just don't know enough about um the hell portion of Xenoscope. So I just wasn't as interested in it because of that, but I think Cinderella is an interesting character and the artwork was pretty good for this issue. So overall, Cinderella issue two gets um, two and a half stars for me. Again, I just couldn't get into the story, uh, but I will try to continue I don't know. Maybe I, I think I will skip issue three because, uh, again, I'm a little lost with that portion of the story. It's just definitely not new reader friendly. So uh, Cinderella issue two gets 2.5 stars for me. All right. So now we're moving on to number 17. Yes, number 17, which is Smallville Continuity issue one. Uh, so with Smallville, this is definitely lower than I expected. Uh, I think it gets a lot better towards the end because most of this issue is everyone's separate. You know, Oliver dealing with his stuff, you know, Chloe getting ready with the baby, Lois and Clark trying to get rid of that world, trying to get away from it and go into their original world, and that threat trying to destroy the world. And now Clark is like, well, we're going to war and I need everyone's help. So you get to see the Titans, uh, Batman, which I love. I love the, the ending and even the artwork is really good for this series too, but it takes so long to get to that point. Um, as I love the interaction towards the end, even that Lois and Chloe interaction where Chloe says, oh yeah, you know when I healed you with my uh, tears, like, hey, when did that happen? It's like a long story, but it did happen. Finally, Chloe mentions that to uh, Lois. I don't even think Lois knew that Chloe was a meteor freak, so that's something that made me happy as someone, as a Smallville fan, that was waiting for that moment for, for Lois to find that out. Um, but overall, the ending was very good, but it just took too long to get there, and uh, that's why it's a bit lower. And I also just don't like the threat that much. The threat is really boring me. Whenever Lex is on screen, or just the villain, that, that portion bores me a bit. But overall, this issue for me gets three stars. Alright, now we're moving on to number... We are up to number 16, which is... Super Girl issue 27. Uh, this issue, you know, there's a lot of pros and cons here. The pros is that Supergirl is actually really good in this issue, but everything else isn't. Uh, I like the artwork also. That's a big pro. I think the artwork is great for the series, fits the series very well. And Supergirl and her narration is the part I really liked about this issue. I, I like this is the Supergirl I know, or at least, you know, a version of the Supergirl I know. She's not the hating Supergirl. Woe is me, Supergirl. She's regular trying to find her way Supergirl uh, without being annoying and whiny. Uh, so I like that about her and I really do like her character. It's everything else, the Crucible School and the supporting characters that just don't have enough heart yet. Uh, and that's why I think this it, the series has a lot of potential. Once these characters and hopefully once these characters get heart, that's when the series will uh, get a lot better. So. 
For me, this is a three-star book. I'm still a little bit on the bored side with the other characters, but I like the direction Supergirl's character is going, and I'm very curious to see where Superboy's going and how he adds up to all of this. And uh, I also didn't like the politics, government, crucible stuff. But let's see where this series goes. Overall, I'm more impressed with this series than it has been. It's making me stick with it for a little while. So Supergirl issue 37 uh, gets three stars for me. All right, now we're up to number 15, which is Hobgoblin issue three. Um, Hobgoblin, you know, I would have given this a higher grade because the artwork is actually really great here. I thought it was a fun issue. Uh, we get to see that Phil Urich is trying to defeat um, Kingsley, the original Hobgoblin, and this is very tied into Axis, though, and I feel that's why this issue is a lot lower, is because the ending was very unsatisfying. You don't really know what happens to Hobgoblin or Ben, in, uh, not Ben, or Phil in the end, um, because it's really, uh, Hobgoblin saying, hey, yeah, I'm a nice guy, where I guess he was tricking Phil saying he wasn't a nice guy, uh, which confused me because he's supposed to be affected by Axis, so he should be a really nice guy in his own way, or, you know, flip of his personality, uh, but then he joins the Avengers, which I was like, oh, that's so Axis of you. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you know, I'm not a big fan of Axis, so that ending kind of bothered me, but overall, I thought it was a fun issue. It was definitely one of the better issues of Axis, and artwork was really well done, so that's why I'm giving it, uh, three stars. And it's up to you guys if you want to pick it up. <laughs> Alright, so now we're up to, I think, number 14? Yes, we are up to number 14, which is... Wonder Woman, issue 37. Uh, yes, Wonder Woman uh, is a bit lower than I wanted it to be. But uh, I wasn't even expecting to get Wonder Woman, uh, just because I didn't love the last issue. I was like, oh, you know, I'm just not a big Wonder Woman fan, so I'll skip it. But then I heard about the cliffhanger, so I was like, alright, gotta get this now, because Donna Troy. Uh, so that's what happens. It's really Wonder Woman trying to figure out where she is in life right now. Does she go back to the human world? Is she this Amazon print, uh, queen? Um, trying to figure that all out, which she's been doing. And then finding out that someone's trying to create Donna Troy. Is this her replacement in a way? Or are the Amazons done with Wonder Woman? Uh, so that does intrigue me. But why this issue is a bit lower for me is because I'm not a big fan of the artwork. I still do think the artwork's a bit dark for me. So, I don't know. There's something off with the artwork for me. I think it's just not my taste. Uh, and also, the story's a bit on the slow burn side until we get to the ending with uh, Donna, which intrigues me enough to get the next issue. So, uh, overall, I gave Wonder Woman three stars. I think Donna Troy's cliffhanger, again, intrigued me. Um, but it was spoiled for me, so that's why it's a bit lower. So, Wonder Woman issue 37 um, gets three stars. Alright, let's move on to number 13, which is All New X-Men, issue 34. All New X-Men. Um, pretty good issue. I liked it. Uh, this got 3.5 stars for me. I thought the artwork was a bit cartoony, so I would say that was a little bit of a fault here. Cartoony artwork. Also, let's get to right here is a good example too. A little bulgy because of it. Um, so, what did I think about this issue? I like certain parts of it. Iceman liked his story a lot because you could see what the Ultimate Universe thinks of mutants and how it's a bit different of the modern world of the 616 universe. You know, some people care about mutants, you know, it's a little less controversial, controversial, but with the Ultimate Universe, pretty much everyone hates mutants. It's a very controversial subject in the Ultimate Universe. So I do like that idea, um, and just uh, and Iceman story is a lot of fun. Jean Grey story is definitely the best, just seeing both Jean Grey uh, interact with each other uh, and seeing how different but alike they both are. So that that was great. Um, but what bored me was the Beast story. Like, I don't care about Beast uh, <laughs> at all, uh, especially in this story. He's trying to make an agreement with Doctor Doom. I was like, all right, who cares? Uh, but then the X-23 story was pretty good, you know, her interacting with Jimmy, and then X-23 and Angel just pretty much talking about everything that's happened. It's like, oh yeah, you have to go back to your world, but it might be impossible. Jimmy's like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> so I did like that part of the story, but why, again, it got a bit lower is because of the artwork could have been a bit better. Um, and it doesn't progress the story that much, no, but I thought it was a fun issue and definitely worth picking up. So, All New X-Men issue 34 gets 3.5 stars for me. Alright, I think we're up to number 12, 
Let me just make sure. We are up to number 12, and this is the lowest the series has been, like, ever. <laughs> so, that is uh, Miles Morales, The Ultimate Spider-Man, issue 8. Uh, this, again, this is, like, always pick of the week, or at least in my top five. Usually, literally, it's always pick of the week, It's just because I think it's a phenomenal series. Uh, but with this week, it does change the flow of the issue. But I do think this issue is very important. I wouldn't say skip this story arc, because this is a very important story arc. It's uh, Miles' father explaining who he is and how he might be working for S.H.I.E.L.D., how he was in a gang, and how he was a bad guy. Uh, but we see maybe his uh, life definitely turns, and how uh, what his relationship was with his brother. And I love Miles in the end, because it gets in a really interesting cliffhanger, because Miles is like, oh, what, ha what happened to Mom? Like, you know, what happens? He's like, oh, we're going to get further into that story. So we know there's a part two. But I'm interested to see how Miles' mother um, is a part of this. Maybe she is a bigger part of this. Uh, and how this connects to S.H.I.E.L.D. and Hydra. And Kate, also. So overall, why is this issue a bit lower is the artwork. The inking could have been a lot better here. It definitely pulls you out of the story a bit, but I did like the story. As much as i rather had a Miles story, and the Miles story probably would have been higher, uh, you need the story to progress to get to another Miles story. So overall, I did enjoy this issue. I'm excited to read the next issue, see what, um, pretty much how the story continues, and who Miles' father is, but, again, the artwork is a, a bit off, and uh, I've read better from Miles Morales, but this is still a good issue. So overall, Miles Morales' Ultimate Spider-Man gets 3.5 stars. Alright, so now we're up to number... We're up to number 11, which is... Spider-Woman, issue 2. Uh, definitely higher than it was for uh, issue 1. I thought this was a bit of an improvement. Um... Artwork still has some weird facial expressions with Greg Land, but I've seen worse artwork. Uh, overall, I like this issue because you get to see a little bit more of Jessica. I do think Captain Marvel actually had a better depiction of Jessica, more of the fun side of Jessica. But that's a whole different story. Um, with this issue, we get to see, um, I think, a better continuation of Spider-Verse. It's not issue one, so you're not jumping into this new series like, oh, why are we talking about Spider-Verse? Who the hell is Jessica? For some people. Of course, I know who Jessica is, but I think some people who don't know who Spider-Woman is, people are going to be confused. And I still think people are a bit confused with this issue, but there's a little bit more explanation of who Jessica is. And it's less crowded, too. It's only Silk and Spider-Woman. It's mostly Jessica. So I think that was a big improvement also. And then her seeing her other self, who's actually the girlfriend in a way or I would say mistress of one of the inheritors and the spider woman figures that out in the end in a very interesting cliffhanger so uh, I did like that and I like that Jessica goes a bit undercover to figure out what's going in, on in this world and how to mani manipulate the inheritors and how the hell this spider woman survived compared to all the other uh, spider people and you find out that he, uh, she's the mistress of the inheritor and that's how uh, she ends up, ends up surviving and then Silk also has a really interesting portion here too figure, figuring out the weaknesses of the inheritors so hopefully this adds up to uh, Spider-Man uh, in the regular series, the Amazing Spider-Man and Spider-Verse. Hopefully it does, but I thought this was a pretty interesting story. So overall, Spider-Woman issue 2 gets 3.5 stars. Alright, let's move on to number 10, which is Batman issue 37. Um, this is a bit lower than maybe some of you guys have it up on your list, but the reason I have it um, a little lower, first of all, the secondary story I still feel like is a waste of time. I don't really like the secondary story, and I feel like it's a waste of pages. Um, but also, I mean, I love the artwork here that really brings you into story, and it's so haunting, this book, um, especially just the Joker creeping up on Jim Gordon, which Jim Gordon somehow is in this series, but in Batman Eternal, you know, he's in jail still, so don't get that, like, that's definitely not connected, uh, and, and they don't care to connect it, so that upsets me a little. But overall, like I said, the story is very haunting because of the artwork and the way Scott Snyder tells the story, but the reason it's a, it's a little lower than you guys might expect is, um, even though this is a very good haunting story, um, I don't think the story really progresses that much. Or at least, I don't know, nothing interesting for me really progresses that much. Uh, it's a very slow burn book, and that's what Scott Snyder usually does with Batman, and also just his Joker stories. So overall, I thought it was a three and a half book. I really liked it, but it, it didn't totally impress me with the story. So, Batman issue 37, for me, got 3.5 stars.
All right, let's move on to number nine, which is Guardians of the Galaxy, issue 22. A uh, pretty good issue. I liked it. Um, you know, it's kind of a, not a filler issue, but stuff you could expect issue. Uh, it's pretty much the rest of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Captain Marvel not really in it. She's like flying. She's like, oh, look. Uh, <laughs> Star Lord's running for president. Oh wait, he's running for president and he doesn't really know this? So that's a, a little side story is that the, his people want um, Star Lord to be president and he doesn't know this. So that's kind of a fun story. But the rest of the story is that the Venom symbiote is passed along through Rocket Raccoon and Groot and now Drax. So that's pretty much all the story is where is Venom gonna go next? So it's how would the Guardians of the Galaxy act if they were Venom? So as much as this is a fun story, it doesn't progress anything that much, but it's a fun story, good artwork, I enjoyed it overall. Um, I think if you're a super fan of Guardians of the Galaxy, like I'm not a super fan at all of Guardians of the Galaxy, you'll love this issue, but if you're just a casual fan or you like the movies, you'll probably like this issue just to see how they would interact as Venom. So overall, I thought it was a good issue, not the best thing I've ever read, but it's a good fun issue. Guardians of the Galaxy, issue 22, gets 3.5 stars. Alright, let's move on to number 8, which is a surprising one that's so high up. The Weapon Next Program, issue 4. This surprised me. I, I really liked it. I was a little confused at some parts, but I did like it. Um, we learned a little bit more about Endo's character, and she tries to run away, and we find out she was actually a male beforehand, but not like, you know, it wasn't like her choice to become a male, it was just part of the experiment that they changed her to female for some reason. So I didn't really get that part of why they had to change her gender, but I hope that's explained as the series goes on, but I thought it was interesting how they ma manipulated her mind. Um, and you're learning a bit more about her character, but my favorite part of this issue definitely is the ending. We find out who's controlling um, Sharp, and that is Ogan, who I did not expect. I think, you know, it's now like, oh, why didn't I think about that? But I thought that was really cool little cliffhanger. It's like, oh my god, Ogan's the one who's taking control of Sharp. So overall, I thought that was a really good cliffhanger. I like that we're learning more about Endo, but again, they could have explained that a little bit better. I don't think they did, but uh, yeah, I thought that overall this was a good issue. I like this as a mini series. I don't think I'd be so dedicated to it if it was ongoing, but I'm excited to see where the next six issues go, and I guess see what happens with uh, the weekly series, which is three nine nine. so I don't know if I'm going to totally get the weekly series, but... Supposedly, they have a big part into uh, the Wolverine's uh, uh, weekly series. So the Weapon, uh, Weapon X program gets um, three and a half stars for me. That was number four. Well, not number four on the list. That was issue four of Weapon X. Um, number seven on the list is Captain Marvel issue 10. This is a really fun story, but let's just get to the cons before I get to the pros. Uh, cons of this is this is very much a celebration of Kelly Sue DeConnick series more than Captain Marvel herself. And that's something I was a bit upset with. I wanted more of her past, more of how she got her powers, as I know that, but it's always fun to be nostalgic and have a retrospective of who Carol Danvers is. And all the series that happened, not just Kelly Sue DeConnick series. And this was more of a celebration of her series than the rest of the Captain Marvel um, series. So that upset me a little. I was like, ah, you know, a little disappointed with that. But the stuff she does tell here is a lot of fun and brings Captain Marvel back to Earth. Thank God. I'm not a big space fan. I've been enjoying the Captain Marvel uh, stuff, but I do like her a lot on Earth and kind of like Nova does, where he goes to space sometimes, but always has some stories on Earth. I think they do a good balance there. So with Captain Marvel, um, I gave it four stars. It was a really fun story with Spider-Woman saying, hey, there's a rat problem, and you see the great friendship, uh, friendship between Spider-Woman and Carol Danvers. Um, and then seeing that Carol does have to go back to Earth because of problems that's happened. So uh, somebody wants to kill Carol, or... Yeah, I would say Kill Carol, who, and I think this is from um, more of Kelly Sue DeConnick's previous series than her current one, um, Who Wants to Kill Her. So that's what I'm saying. Definitely more of a retrospective of DeConnick series than um, 
than Captain Marvel herself. But our work was a lot of fun, fit the series really well, and I'm looking forward to seeing um, Carol spend some Christmas time on Earth, so really excited for that. Overall, I gave Captain Marvel four stars. Um, I was thinking three and a half because I do think four ninety nine is a bit heavy for a price tag, but I did jump it up to four stars because I do think this was a really fun story. So Captain Marvel issue 10, four stars, and that was number seven. So what was number six? was Fantastic Four, issue 14. Um, Fantastic Four, it was a good issue. I liked it a lot. Um, There's a really interesting revelation that this guy who wanted to be with Sue and didn't have the chance is the person behind all this. So that was a really fun revelation. And then Sue and uh, the rest of the team teaming up, uh, trying to figure out more about Franklin's Heroes Reborn uh, world. And that's always fun. And they're going to have to attack some people here. Uh, I guess they're the people from Heroes Reborn or the people from Avengers. Because there's Falcon over there. So uh, they're fighting them. And again, there's a lot of different stories going on with the Franklin story. Um, what's actually going on. Who actually plotted all of this. And then whatever happened in that cliffhanger. Which it seemed like maybe it's an Axis connection. So overall, Fantastic Four was a very solid series. Artwork, of course, is beautiful. Cliffhanger was a little unsatisfying, but the rest is a great build-up, and I love that twist of this stalker person who likes Sue is the whole reason for this happening. Um, so overall, I give Fantastic Four uh, four stars. So let's get to top five. Number five, Justice League, issue 37. Uh, Justice League was a really solid issue, I'll say that. Um, I really liked it just because, um, even though it's a point A and a point B issue, there's some good emotional beats with Lex and his sister, giving him some humanity, um, and then, uh, you know, a cliffhanger of Batman, um, his suit breaking, so he's affected by the virus. So why this issue I felt like could have been a bit higher is... Like I said, it's really a point A to point B issue. Not a lot's happening here, but it's still a fun issue, solid issue. Can't give it higher than that, but the artwork's beautiful, and I'm still looking forward to seeing where the Maze of Virus goes. And I did like the cliffhanger overall of Batman's uh, mask breaking, and uh, see where the story goes. So overall, Just League issue 37 was very solid. Um, that's number five, and I give that four stars. All right, so let's move on to number four which is Electra, issue 9. I am always so impressed with Electra, especially with the current artist. Um, here's an example of the current artwork. It's just so smooth and fits the story so well and Electra's personality. I would not say this artwork is perfect for everybody, but it really fits this title. And I think Electra has been a really under the radar series, and it's a real shame that it is getting canceled. Uh, it's it is. I feel like not enough people gave it a try, and it, I think it's a really well done series, uh, and it just fits Electra's personality very well. I just think Electra just can't hold her own book, which is a shame because I think she's a character that should be able to hold her own book. Um, story wise, does just sales wise, it doesn't. With this issue, we get to see that. Um, Electra's trying to figure out how to find Bullseye and how to destroy the hand, of course. And, uh, that's pretty much the whole story. Really is trying to destroy the hand and try to find Bullseye. And look at this amazing artwork right here. That's what really impressed me here. I think even more than the story, the story is really just, hey, you know, Electra's trying to find Bullseye. Um, but it's so, the artwork is beautiful. And the way the, the story is paced is great. So overall, Electra issue 9 gets, uh, four stars. Also, I want to mention this heartbreaking, um, scene of Electra saying what she wanted to say to Daredevil is saying, oh yeah, I want to go with you to San Francisco, but because she's a lecturer, she says no. So that's a great scene also, just showing who she is with Daredevil and really just getting into her mind. That's what I love about this series overall, is that it's not just about Electra's actions, but it's about getting into the, um, this, um, this assassin's mind and how she makes the wrong decisions or the right decisions. And that's what I really like, is the inner monologue here. So Electra, again, four stars, really enjoyed this issue. All right, let's move on to number three, which is Miss Marvel issue 10. Fun issue. Uh, you know, one thing I will say to the one con here is that I do think the adventure story has been prolonged a bit. I kind of want the adventure story to end, but overall, Miss Marvel is still a very charming character here. Just the thing she says, this is a hip 
in the now series and I think it commentates on culture and seeing how um, today's world, the contemporary world, through a teenager's eyes. And that's what I love about Miss Marvel, and I think she has a great personality. Artwork is great for the series. And even though I didn't love the Inventor story, and, uh, you know, most of this issue is about how to get to the Inventor, how to destroy Inventor, just how Miss Marvel interacts in this situation is what's great about it. So, um, overall, I gave Miss Marvel four stars. Um, I think the actual villain should improve a bit more, but the character really made me love this issue. So, four stars for Miss Marvel, um, issue 10. Alright, let's move on to number two, which is Arrow, issue three, uh, Arrow season 2.5, issue three. Um, I actually said this was my pick of the week in the review of Arrow, um, but when I actually reviewed the, the other comic, which actually is my pick of the week, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna put Arrow as number two. As much as I did like, um, Arrow, I do think it did go to number two, because the other one kind of impressed me a bit more, but I really enjoyed Arrow. Um, why it didn't get four and a half stars, though, is the artwork's a bit off. As much as I like pretty much every character besides, um, Oliver, his facial hair just does not work. Um, Here's some really good examples here. So I feel like they just can't draw Oliver, but every other character is pretty well drawn here. And I like that this the series is very much in the vein of Arrow, especially since the writer of Arrow of the show is writing the series, but it fills in the blanks very well. Having a fun adventure with Brother Blood and also, you know, some great moments with Thea. Um, we actually get a Thea scene. Hopefully we can see her training in this series. Um, Laurel, I thought, was really good here interacting with the Arrow team. Um, the villain was interesting. It's just, I thought it was just a great mix of chemistry with characters and just explaining everything that's happened in between and just having a really fun roller coaster ride here. Um, and also we get to see Huntress in the cliffhanger. I don't know how I feel about that because I don't love her character in the show. Uh, but overall, I thought this was a very fun issue and a great tie in book. So, Arrow Season 2.5, Issue 3 gets uh, four stars for me. So what got number one is Teen Titans issue five. Who knew a new 52 title of Teen Titans can get my pick of the week? I will say it didn't get past four and a half. There wasn't anything that totally, oh my God, blew my mind this week. But this was the best issue I read this week um, because I think everyone was in character and that made me ecstatic. Cassie, the interaction that he, she had with her mother was very much in character. Her kind of debating what to do with her life was always that debate in the pre New 2. Tim kind of saying, yeah, Stars, we'll, Stars Lab, we'll definitely team up with you, but actually trying to figure out more about Stars Labs. Um, I thought the teenagers who got superpowers were a lot of fun. And then the cliffhanger with the new character who pretended to be Wonder Girl's fan um, actually being a superhero. I thought that was an awesome cliffhanger. Um, even though the artwork was a bit odd with the facial expressions, I think you got used to it. I would say that's like one of my only nitpicks for this issue because everything else was pretty good. You felt the chemistry between the team. I won't say they're family, but you felt the chemistry bet between the team. You had a really interesting story throughout the whole issue, which I'm very happy about. And overall, everyone was in character. That's a success story for me, for the new 52 Teen Titans. Hopefully it stays on this route. Maybe they'll even become family in the end. But I was very impressed with Teen Titans issue 5. And I gave this 4 stars and pick of the week. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed. Please tell me in the comments below what was your pick of the week, your worst pick of the week. Hope you guys enjoyed. And, and also everything in between there. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed. This is Comic Frontline and Comic Uno. Guys, don't forget to follow me on Twitter for Comic Uno and the right situations. Don't forget to like my Facebook page. Also, description below, there's links for my comic books, uh, comic book, Like Father, Like Daughter. And don't forget to like the Facebook page, Like Father, Like Daughter. I'll see you guys later.